theme, communication in the age of crisis, putting people at the center. My name is Rose Sang. I'll be moderating um, the session. So karibuni sana. Now, in every industry and every business size, crisis communication is a common topic of discussion. With every passing year, a growing number of companies are investing more and more resources into emergency communication methods and planning. In fact, an estimated 84% of organizations have an emergency communication plan in place, according to the Business Continuity Institute. 55% use three or more emergency communication processes, and yet nearly two thirds say they aren't confident about their preparedness for a crisis event. While the threat of COVID-19 has triggered a serious global health concern, a great deal of the war and fear surrounding the disease is being fueled by widespread miscommunication. So how do organizations then communicate at this time of COVID-19? What are the best practices to adopt when communicating with staff? Are there effective ways to get people to make individual sacrifices such as salary cuts, fear of contracting the disease at work? How do we improve trust in our messages even when the leadership isn't clear on the direction to take? And lastly, how do we put all this into a communication plan so that then we're able to use it for purposes of ensuring adequate communication within the organization? So to help us unpack this topic, um, it is my pleasure to have my good friend, Stella Kiguta Nganga, who is a corporate communications expert and visionary business leader with an excellent record in strategic communications, public affairs, crisis management, and brand public relations. She is the CEO and founder of Brand Essence Public Relations, a boutique agency offering communication services to small and medium-sized enterprises. Stella has a wide range of experience in communication and crisis management, having worked for various multinationals such as Coca-Cola, GlaxoSmithKline, that is GSK, and KPMG. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in communication from Dista University in Nairobi, Kenya, and is a member of the Public Relations Society of Kenya and the Chartered Institute of Public Relations. So we couldn't have gotten a better speaker for this topic today. So welcome, Stella to the platform. You can now take it from here. Thank you, Rose. Uh, I trust you can all hear me clearly. Yes, we can. Okay. All right. So good morning, uh, everyone. And Rose, thank you for inviting me to one of the most uh, prestigious and um, most esteemed, uh, shall I say, body of professionals um, in the country. It's my pleasure to speak to all of you. And I trust that you and your families and the people that you lead and serve are doing well in what is to use a very common parlance nowadays in very unprecedented, um, a very unprecedented season. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about communication in the age of crisis and most importantly about putting people at the center. And so to set the stage, what I'd like us to do is to imagine that we are going into an election period and the people who are voting for us or the people who will vote against us are the people who we are called to serve who are the employees of our organizations the other thing that i want to you know put in as we set the context is that i appreciate that in many organizations that are represented here uh, internal communications or communicating with employees is either led by the hr function or is supported by the communications function or the PR function. So I do appreciate that many of you on this call are probably the lead communicators or you do work with communicators across in another function. Uh, the third context that I would like to set is that when we are discussing crisis in this context, we will use COVID-19 as the you know, as the imagery, because it's what is top of mind right now. But what I want you to understand is that crisis is the order of business and it is the nature of the day and the time that we live in. So when I talk about COVID, you can put in an employee issue, you can put in a product issue that, you know, that has gone maybe externally, but you do need to communicate to your employees internally. So that's the frame that I would like us to have, okay? So like I've said, rapid change is the order of business. Uh, one time, you know, in December, we all read, you know, at the end of, of the 
of the month or sometime at the beginning of January that, uh, you know, there was this virus that had started to spread somewhere in China. None of us would have imagined that in this day, the entire world, with the exception of Antarctica, would have a recorded case of the virus. The thing has spread very fast and with it has come such change. It has disrupted the way we live. It has disrupted the way we work. It has disrupted the way we interact with each other. If you think about uh, physical distancing and you know you can't go and hug your friends, you can't go out and visit children are cooped up in the house and you know getting distressed. Uh, sometimes the house, the whole household is having cabin fever. People want to go out, they can't. Uh, we've seen the sad instances of people who have passed away in this season, whether from COVID-19 or not and how we cannot be part of those things that make us human, those things that make us, uh, you know, connect and interact, you know, weddings with four to 15 people. Uh, your typical Kenyan or African wedding would have upwards of 500 people, uh, you know, and that's a small wedding. So it has really disrupted. And this is not just COVID-19. This is the age to come because we're talking about things like technological changes with the automation, with the, with the AI, you know, that will change the way we work. When machines begin to be part and parcel of our workforce, how do we handle that as people? Uh, when we talk about the demographics of any society, Africa is one of the youngest continents, but with that youth brings in some uh, opportunities, but equally so challenges in terms of how you manage a workforce that will not necessarily be loyal to one employer. So you're looking at people who have worked in, you know, in a company for 30 years, 20 years. Now people will want to have 10 different employers because they consider themselves an entity and a company in their own right. And with that comes a lot of policy you know, issues in, in government and how we handle. I know right now a lot of companies are having conversations with their legal teams about, you know, do we send people on unpaid leave? How do we get people to agree to take salary cuts? And if they don't, what is the next step? So there's a lot that is changing in a, in a very short time. And we have to be ready to adapt and more importantly, put people at the heart of every decision that we make. So today I want us to look at uh, this lady here, uh, Jacinda Arden, uh, who's the Prime Minister of New Zealand, because in this season right now, she has emerged as one of the most effective leaders around the world dealing with COVID-19. I mean, if you were to put her on one, one end of the spectrum, her, um, you know, her opposite would be Donald Trump on the other end. So if you look at the, the two of them side by side, you can really see the differences and the, and the way they've managed uh, the issues. And I want to talk about that, about her leadership style and her communication style and how she has not just endeared uh, the people of New Zealand to her, but equally so the world. Uh, Winston Churchill uh, once said in preparation for a battle, cometh the hour, cometh the man. In this instance, of course, it's cometh the woman. And I do appreciate that I'm speaking to a diverse audience of people. But this woman has taken the crisis and just ridden it like a wave, you know, and, and taken it to the next level. And how she's done that is by doing three things. And if you take nothing away from today's conversation, these are the three things that I would like you to put into perspective. One of the things that she has done very well is making meaning of what is happening around her. And all leaders must do that. You must make meaning of the situation making sure that people understand the big picture and where they fit in the big picture, trying to make sense of an issue that is morphing very quickly and being quick to balance both the positive and the negative because there are two sides to, to every coin, to every situation, to every crisis. The other thing that Jacinda has done very well is giving direction. So not only is she making meaning, but in the process, she's also giving direction and providing clarity where there is fog. And in doing that, she's not only calling for individual cooperation, but also as a leader of a government, she's also applying a command and control style. And it's very important to understand when to apply which, and we'll see some examples of how she's doing that. And then empathy. Empathy is really at the heart of all this. And this is what we talk about, putting people at the center of every decision that you make. And what you find with Jacinta, Jacinda is that she has become very vulnerable. She, her approach and her style is vulnerable. 
and, and leaders need to be vulnerable to be able to say, I don't know, but I will find out. Or this is a period of rapid change and we all must adapt and move together. But equally so being compassionate and unifying, calling people to a collective good, calling people to collective action, but at the same time understanding that individuals are impacted differently uh, from person to person. So if we just go through them in detail, so what's meaning making? So on 21st March, uh, New Zealand went public uh, with their first, this was her first address on coronavirus. You would appreciate that in the Kenyan context, uh, we went out with our announcement on the 13th of March. So she came a week after us. This was her first public address. And one of the things you take out of her presentation and her conversation is that she was transparent. So she was transparent about what was happening around the world. She was transparent about what is coming and she was able to anchor New Zealand on the big picture, okay? The big picture here being that she appealed to the country's higher nature. So she called them to action, understanding the challenges together, but painting a picture of moving as a team, moving as a country, collective good, collective duty, that there were sacrifices that were going to have to be made, but those sacrifices were for the greater good. They were for everyone's good. And I think in many organizations right now, our leaders, the CEOs that we support, um, and other business leaders, of course, on the team, really need to put this front and center, that you need to remind people of why your organization exists, the greater good, but at the same time, you also have to be clear about what the individual sacrifices are that people will need to make, sacrifices that the organization will need to make so that everybody is able to pivot to the future. Uh, you also need to help people to understand how you will respond. So in Jacinda's context, one of the things that she said is we'll go hard and we will go early. And we will show in the next slide how she did that. But her parting shot, which became a very inspirational call around the world, was to tell people to be strong, to be kind, and to unite. Okay, so whatever conversation you're having in your organizations, you need to urge people as you remind them of the big picture, why your organization exists. You have to keep reminding people to be strong, to face the headwinds that are coming. And that's part of courage. That's being having courage because you move afraid. You don't know the future, but you still have to move. You have to be kind and be empathetic to understand that people will be impacted differently uh, by the issue, but then to unite because you are one team, one group, one body. So you need to all move together in the same direction. So let's talk about direction giving. So in that telecast that was eight minutes long, uh, Jacinda Arden announced a four-level alert system. Now, as you know, that part of the world uh, is very famous for, you know, for fires. And so they already have a fire risk system in process that is well known to the citizens. And so Jacinda modeled that. She took that and set clear guidelines for how the government would respond in line with those four levels. And with each step, she was very clear about what would be asked of citizens if the infections grew. So if you look at, for example, when they were at level two, when there was a bit of restricted movement and, you know, calls for social distancing, within four days, she moved the country to total lockdown. Just within a period of four days, she moved the country to total closure, okay? And people understood why, and citizens knew what would be required of them. So they accepted the challenge. And if you look back, um, if, if you look back here at, at this slide, when we're talking about appealing to the higher nature and sacrifices to come, she communicated them very clearly and very effectively. At each stage, this is what will be required of you. So at day two, we'll need you not to move around too much and we'll need you to observe the physical distancing guidelines. But in four days, the country was in total lockdown and we will see at the end uh, of the next slide how that has delivered results for New Zealand. The third thing that uh, Jacinda has done 
is to show empathy. Now, empathy, you know. Sorry, we Stella, about... we seem to be losing you. Can you hear me? Am I clear now? Yes, now we can, we can hear you. So perhaps just go back a little bit because we lost you for a bit. Okay. Where at this slide or the previous slide? That's the previous slide, yeah. This one? Yes. Yeah, when you talked about you know, appealing to the higher good. So you can proceed from there. Okay, all right, I apologize for that. So we've talked about making meaning and saying that uh, call people to the collective good, okay? And what she did is that she used a statement, go hard and go early. Okay, so people were able to understand that within a short period of time, we will have to make rapid changes and make rapid moves uh, that will require sacrifice on everybody's part. But what she did and issued a clarion call that has resonated around the world is that she told people to be strong, to be kind and to unite. So strong in the face of headwinds that are unclear for both the leader and the team that you are leading. Being kind, which is about having empathy for each other, having empathy for your leadership, but equally so having empathy for your employees, and then together acting as one body and one force, uniting against the common enemy. So talking about direction giving, um, Jacinda in that telecast uh, of the 21st of March uh, announced a four level system okay an escalation model which uh, the australians know because of the fire risk that are, that is already in those countries in australia new zealand so she issued a new zealand the, a, a four level code that is similar to what they use for the fires and she set clear guidelines about how the government would respond and how citizens were expected to act okay so people knew at every stage what was expected of them so for example, when they were at level two, they understood that they had restricted travel and movement, just like we do here, and restricted contact um, with each other. But within a period of four days, they had already gone to level four, which was a total lockdown of the country, because in that period, the numbers had jumped quite significantly. But she was able to make a quick decision in four days, and the citizens knew what was required of them, and they accepted the challenge. And you will see in, in the next, uh, just after the next slide, what results uh, Jacinda had. Okay. Rosa, am I clear so far? Yes, you're very clear. Thank you. Thank you. So let's talk about empathy. Empathy is putting people at the heart of everything we say and do. If you were to put it uh, in the sense of the golden rule, you would say do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So let's look at Jacinda outside of COVID-19 and just look at her within another context. So we know that in March of 2019, there was a shooting of Muslim faithful at Christ Church uh, where 50 or 50 people died. And some of the images you see on the right are images that really pushed her leadership and made it very visible globally because what she did, number one, is she spent very little time talking about the enemy and took more time focused uh, her energies and her words and her effort on the victims and their loved one and a nation that needed to come together and heal as one. Uh, if you look at the tone of her messages, she said, or she implied that the victims of this crime may or may not share your faith or ethnicity, but they're New Zealanders and that's all that matters. Again, appealing to the higher good, calling people to to a higher state of, of thinking and trying to move them out of just their little cocoons, bearing in mind that, of course, everybody has their own frame of, of reference, but trying to call people to see the big picture. And she did that very well. And I think we recall these pictures of her dressed in a hijab, going to the mosque. I mean, if you look at the first picture, um, those who are well acquainted with the Muslim faith will know that uh, that kind of, of close... Um, proximity between a male and a female who are not married or related um, is one that is observed uh, fairly strictly. Um, in some contexts, you don't even shake hands with somebody of the opposite gender. But when you appeal to the heart and you speak to the humanity of people, 
all, you know, people are very different, but people are very much the same. People want to be heard. People want to know that you heard them and people want to know that you care. And Jacinda heard these people and she cared about them. And you can see her and a very warm reception from the people there. Uh, what you need to do as a leader now, I'm not, you know, in, especially in this age where we are being told not to hug each other or come close. The question is, how are your actions and how are your words creating that feeling of a hug that you understand people, that you hear them, that you're doing the best for them? OK, how, how are you showing that you're seeking to understand them before you want to be understood? And in so doing, you're creating space and room for the feelings of others. So if you do those three things, what should you expect? Effective communication, whether internal or external, should yield results, okay? In Jacinda's case, and please allow me to refer here, uh, a recent poll of how the government has handled COVID-19 in New Zealand has yielded an 88% approval rating. If you check that against the G7 uh, summit countries, they are all trending at about 57%. So she's significantly higher than how the other countries have, have, you know, uh, have approached the situation. And if you look at their numbers, you know, the numbers that we, uh, we read daily on, on our screens, uh, in New Zealand, which has a population of 5 million, 1,476 people have been confirmed or considered as probable cases of COVID-19. There are 1,241 recoveries. There are just over 200 uh, people who have ac active cases, about 235 people with active cases. And of those, 88 of them are just about ready to be discharged. And they have 19 deaths. If you compare that to Kenya, we already have 15 deaths as of yesterday. So you can see, and there were headlines that showed very clearly that her actions as a leader, her early actions, you know, go hard, go early, uh, that empathy, helping people to understand uh, what's coming next, uh, have actually, as the Washington Post wrote a headline recently, not only has she flattened the curve, she smashed it. And in the last day or so, they are only reporting single digit cases and low single digits. So they are recent uh, cases of COVID-19 as of yesterday were three people. Okay, so effective communication that speaks to the heart, that speaks to the mind will also yield action. So it will yield action. It will create understanding. So people are approaching things from the same frame of reference. It will inspire confidence in your leadership. It will deliver results. It will facilitate feedback and it will strengthen relationships. And if you do all that, what you get is high trust. And I think all organizations are aspiring for high trust with their stakeholders. We always say that our people are, are our greatest asset, and this is the time to show and to prove that our people are our greatest asset. So how do we you know, progress from here? What are some of the things that we would like to see going forward or some of the things you can consider? Maybe some of the things you are already doing uh, or some of the things you could amplify based on Jacinda. And let me put it this way. I know Jacinda is a global leader, uh, you know, and she's from another part of the world, maybe not very much within our context. But I think when you think about human beings, like I said earlier, people want to be heard and people want to know that you care. That is the human condition around the world. And so there, there are things that we can lift off from her leadership and apply it to ourselves in our context. Now, employees are not expecting their leaders to be demigods, to be able to read the signs of the times and prophetically interpret what is going to happen. They understand that their leaders are just as anxious and uncertain about the future. And so are they. And I think this is the time for us to all come together and have this collective sense of we are in the same ship. The problem with uh, leadership sometimes and the way we communicate is us versus them, all right? This is not an us versus them situation. Either we win together in the same ship as friends or we perish as fools and we need to choose how we are going to do it. So vulnerability for leadership at this point is very important. 
uh, but being vulnerable, but still providing direction. Okay. And what you want to do is to turn your employees into ambassadors and allies, your supporters, people who can advocate for you. Okay. Like, remember, we said at the beginning of this uh, conversation is that you are in an election. And every time you walk into the office, please understand that your voting pool is your employees. And they choose to vote for you either by staying and continuing to support and drive the business agenda, or they choose to vote for you by leaving or being disengaged. So you have to win your electorate. And winning your electorate means that you have to have a strong ground game. And how do you do that? So one of the things you need to do is to make sure that if you're not doing this already, you need to communicate regularly. Please don't speak to employees on the first of the month and then the next time you speak to them is the 15th of the next month. You have to keep a regular heartbeat with your teams. Make sure that you're speaking to them no less than every other day. And when you do that, use a shared and trusted platform okay and now of course platforms have moved very quickly so whatsapp may not have been relevant for business communications formal business communications but it may have to be so organizations will need to adapt okay in terms of where you put this information and bear in mind that as you put this information in a trusted place not all your employees may be able to access that information so if you load information on the intranet but some of your support staff are not uh, device using, you know, computer using associates and you want to put in critical information there, how will you communicate with them? You must make sure that this is in a place where everybody is connected, everybody can access the information freely. The third thing you need to do is to make sure that you deliver bad news with empathy. Now, a lot of organizations, depending on how this pans out, will or have already started sending people on unpaid leave have made some people redundant or are looking at future redundancies. How you communicate that information is very, very important. People should not feel like numbers. Humans are human beings and they need to be treated as such. So be honest with them, have empathy, but don't sugarcoat it or overpromise things that you cannot deliver. All right. But people want the truth. People just want honesty. Okay. And then allow employees to express feelings and share ideas. Yesterday on Twitter, I saw a very interesting uh, Twitter thread of a man who runs, uh, I believe it's a law firm, and he's in Nigeria. And he was talking about how he wrote to his employees a note and said, look, um, we are not getting a lot of work from our clients. And so, of course, that is having an effect on the numbers. Uh, how would you have us to proceed? And after a short time, one employee wrote to him and said, look, I, I understand. We, we, even we have not put in our best work because everybody, of course, is feeling a bit anxious, you know, about the situation that's going on from a health perspective, but equally so can see that work isn't coming. And this person offered to take a 30% pay cut. And then another employee wrote in and said, well, uh, may, I'm happy with whichever decision you take. If you choose to give us a pay cut, that's fine. And a few other emails came in. Shortly after that, he chose to write an email to all of them and say, well, I've gotten your individual feedback. Uh, my decision is that I will pay you your April, April salaries in full, but we will need to have a conversation, you know, in the not too distant future about what happens from May going onward. When he sent that email, the employees came together and had a joint conversation and told him in, in a response uh, a reply email that they were ready to take a pay cut and they were going to take a pay cut and that was their, de their collective decision as employees that they had agreed to do that. And this man writes and says that he's locked himself in the office in tears because he doesn't even know what to do with that level of feedback where employees have shown that level of ownership and commitment to his business um, and taken it as if it was their own, act as an owner. Uh, what he has said, of course, on Twitter is that he will pay them their April salaries, but he's also going to sit with them and work out a way in which to face the months ahead. And what I want to you know, say as leaders is that sometimes you feel that the burden is on your shoulders entirely, but when in actual fact you have a troop of people 
who just like the New Zealanders we talked about a few minutes ago, are very willing and able to support you, to come up with ideas, to come up with um, some sort of framework. They want to do something. In, in a crisis, people want to do something. People just don't want to be spectators and observers. And, you know, when I worked at Coca-Cola, we had a saying, leverage the collective genius. You have geniuses sitting in your workplaces. And unless you tap into that and open for feedback and say, you know, we want to hear from you. How can we work together? You you may be missing out on some of the most insightful pieces of information and action that will inspire you as leaders in the room. So open up to people. How do people want to participate? How do people want to contribute? Allow them to express their feelings. Allow them to share their ideas. Okay. Now, as a leader, it's important. It's good. You know, the, the images of leadership are about power and it's good to look like you're in control. But I think COVID-19 has shown all of us that none of us is in control, whether at a personal or organizational level. And so what you need to do is to learn how to be vulnerable and to say, it's okay. I don't know, but we are going to work hard to find a way. That's very, very important because what you do then is that you tap into the humanity of the person that you're speaking to and together you can find a way forward. All right. The other thing you need to do is to be clear about how you are making decisions about certain things. So if you make a decision to let people go, or you make a decision to put people or, on unpaid leave for a season, whatever business decision you have to make, even if it's a decision to say that when we come back to work, uh, these are new, the new health protocols and regulations that we will have to follow. Please help people understand the journey. How are you moving from point A to point Z? Don't just wake up and slap a, you know, a decision on them without helping people to understand the path that you are taking, the road that you are taking. If we give an example using a local, you know, just our local context here, uh, just a few days ago uh, was an announcement that restaurants and eateries would open. But there was a gap there because what happened the very next day is that people went opening up their restaurants and other places, but the guidelines had not been socialized with the food business owners. So it wasn't until yesterday that these regulations and guidelines were actually posted on the Ministry of Health website. And so there was a gap there in terms of how the process that people needed to take before opening up their outlets. And so, you know, people who opened up yesterday have to shut the outlets and now go back and fulfill the requirements of the guidelines that have been set out by the Ministry of Health. So talk to people about how you have made your decisions how working from home will work, how traveling has been impacted. You know, if you have employees who need to, who have had at some point maybe to go back home or may want to go back to their mother countries, how that will be handled. Explain to people what's going on. Take people on the journey. Don't just, uh, you know, teleport them to what you anticipate to be the place they're supposed to be at. Okay. Now, the other thing you need to do is to provide timely information as and when you know it. So the era that we're living in right now, people are bombarded with so much information. Uh, you know, every channel you check, it's everything is COVID-19. Every tweet you look at is COVID-19. Every Facebook post is COVID-19. How do you give people bite-sized information? This, this is not the era of gourmet communications, long, detailed stories. People want quick, sharp information okay and given to them real time don't wait until you know everything because at that point it's already too late the issue is already ahead of you you need to tell people as at this time and this date this is what we know and you know as soon as we know something else we will keep you posted so give people bite-sized information but give it to them as quickly as you can and just make it easy to understand okay the other thing you need to do is to find ways as an organization to make life easier for your employees. And on this one, I don't know if the, 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 the HR person or the, there's a representative from Vitaform, but I really need to give them a, a round of applause. I think we also earlier in this, you know, this timeline of COVID-19 in Kenya, Vitaform decided to prepare some dry food uh, packs for their employees. Now, they weren't going to give them mattresses, although that's their core business, but they realized that food is going to be an issue. I mean, because 
as you can remember, there were supermarket stockouts of some, you know, some food items, the dry foods, and they put together packs of those dry foods for their companies. When we talk about being, um, uh, having empathy and giving a hug through your actions, this was one of the ways in which people gave a hug, the Vitafoam gave a hug to their employees. So how do you provide, you know, simple things like care packs? Um, have you talked to employees about their medical cover? How is their medical cover impacted by COVID-19? What are those some of the things that you can do as an organization to make life easier? Are you able to provide a helpline so that if somebody is feeling stressed out and they need uh, some counsel or somebody to talk to, do you have a helpline that is open? I, I remember at GSK, uh, before I left um, in 2018, um, we went through a, a change program that impacted uh, 1,700 people across 43 markets. Uh, and all the 1,700 people, you know, had to go home. Uh, and, but one of the things that the company did, and of course, this is something that they have at a global level, uh, was a helpline where people would call. And that helpline was made available six months after the employees had left. The medical cover was made available six months after the employees had helped. Just little things that said, look, we know you have to go, but we want to cushion you for the next so many months so that you're able to get your footing and you can sort yourself out. What are some of those things you can do? Locally, I mean, uh, APSA, uh, announced recently a, a toll-free number where you can call and speak to somebody and get mental health support. Are these things that your employees know and is it a service that you can make available to them? Now, of course, this sounds very nice and warm and hearty, but we are a business and we have results to deliver. So be clear about performance and delivery. What are you expecting people to deliver and how? Now, we all set goals at the beginning of the year. We knew, you know, we're going to do these 10 things and so many things had to be done by quarter one. Life has changed. Has any of the leaders in your organization taken time to sit with the team and say, with what has happened, this is how we are going to deliver things. So this is what is no longer essential and these are the essentials. What is the core that we need to focus on? That's a very important conversation to have with your team. And then to understand some of their barriers, whether it is a personal barrier or it's, a, shall I say, maybe an administrative barrier because maybe the work that they do has to be done in their office, but now they are at home. How are you helping them to navigate those barriers so that they are still able to perform and deliver the core, but within the, you know, the challenges that we are all facing. And then finally is to maintain routines uh, in terms of speaking to your people to avoid isolation. So it's very, very important that a leader not just not only speak to the global team. So let's say you're in HR, don't just speak to the people in HR or the people in supplies, talk to the supply team, it's also important to speak to individuals because not everybody within a group context is expressive. And people in this instance also have their own, shall I say, psychological concerns, challenges that they have as, as people. And so really, if you want to connect with your team and speak to them from the heart, make sure that while you speak to the collective, that you also make time to speak to people one-on-one. -on -one. And this is where delegated leadership is so critical because the CEO might do a, a broadcast to the entire organization and he could speak to, you know, um, to people individually, uh, his leadership team. He may not always be able to speak to the shop floor person. So how are you using the chain within the organization to make sure that even that person who is on the shop floor, you know, the, the person who serves the office tea, you know, your logistics team, your, your messengers, how do those people still feel the same level of connectivity, connectedness? They still have the same information. Um, they still feel the same sense of care, uh, like the rest of the organization that is sitting on the laptops and communicating on Slack or Teams or Skype or, or whatever. So just make sure that the person at the bottom, devolution, this is the era of devolution, devolve your leadership to the bottom so that everybody is able to experience that connectivity and that one team. So today we've talked about COVID. Tomorrow it will be something else. And so here are my, what I like to call my top five, uh, you know, points that you must always remember about 
crisis communication. Number one, don't waste a crisis. Those of you who have watched me on previous webinars know that I'm extremely passionate about this point. Sometimes when there's a crisis, we want to bury our heads in the sand and just pretend like nothing's going on, you know, we'll figure it out when it comes. Don't waste a crisis. Get ahead of it. Do like Jacinda did. Follow her example. Just get ahead of it and move hard. Leverage the challenging time to emerge stronger. Many organizations may be asking questions about how do we get our employees to agree to take a pay cut. But this may, should not necessarily arise if as an organization you have been investing in relationships with your employees ahead of demand. If your employees have felt a duty of care, they have, if they, your employees have felt that you care about them, that you're concerned about their well-being, about their performance, about succeeding, you should already have a, a warm environment in which to broach this conversation. But if you don't, and the relationship in your organization may seem maybe adversarial, this is the opportunity to fix that. So not only face the challenge that we are all facing, but use it as an opportunity to emerge stronger from it. How do you innovate? Are there new tools or things that you have been trying to put in place and maybe this is the time to test them? Don't waste the crisis. Number two, prepare for the next crisis now. Failing to plan is planning to fail. Like they say, it wasn't raining when Noah built the ark, okay? Observe what is happening around the world. Next time you hear there's a virus from some other place, everybody will be on high alert because we have seen what has happened with this one. So as a business, always constantly bring the outside in. Always look out and see what impact it has on your people. Are there organizations that are just like you are going through the same challenge but have found innovative ways to handle some of the employee challenges that you are facing? Bring those in. Adopt, call people, find out how they did it, see if it works. But plan, plan for the next one because the next one is right around the corner. The third thing is about empathy. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Effective communication is speaking to the heart. All human beings have a head and have a heart. But at the end of the day, the heart makes quite a number of decisions. And so always remember that they are actual human beings at the end of every decision you make. I think many of us have watched with keen interest what has happened in Parliament. Uh, a second before COVID-19, everybody was out and about, you know, having rallies, BBI and all that stuff. And it's very quiet right now. Many people don't know where their members of parliament are. The member of parliament has not said very much about COVID-19 or what they're doing about the people. It's like they just suddenly burrowed and entered in some hole. And people are making note. If you look at uh, 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 Governor Joho, Governor Joho has really taken the show with this one. I mean, his people know that they care. I mean, if you saw the lady, I don't know if we all saw the lady at the ferry who could not afford a mask and she had a, a cut of a cutout of a bottle that she had, you know, used to, to mask herself. And the next thing you saw was he was with her, he gave her masks, he gave her some money to start a business. He's gone around Mombasa and put up these, you know, these sanitizing, you know, shower boots that you walk through. I mean, he's doing some really good things in Mombasa. And people feel that, yeah, our governor cares for us. Some people haven't seen their governor since this matter started. And you better rest assured if, if Kenyans, you know, we forget easily. But if we do not forget easily this time around, 2022 might look a little bit different because people will say, by the way, when we were in a crisis, what did this person do for us? So... Always remember, we said at the beginning of this uh, you know, broadcast that we are in an election and people want to know what you have done for them. What have you done for me lately? Please do something for them that remembers, okay? And then number four, nature abhors a vacuum. So if you keep quiet, people will fill the spaces. This is how the grapevine thrives. And so you must make the decision not to fuel the grapevine. Please make sure that there's no vacuum Speak to your people regularly, as we said, and don't just speak, act. I think we have seen people like Alfred Mutua, Dr. Alfred Mutua. We have seen Charity Ngilu, people who have gone and acted, set up, you know, isolation centers in the stadium, has a factory that is producing, you know, the masks and other PPE. That is action speaking louder than words. 
So don't just talk, act. Let people be clear that this is what our organization is doing for us in this season. And then remember finally that everything communicates. Who you choose to speak to the organization. If the CEO is not speaking to the organization, that is saying something. If your leadership teams are not speaking to your people, that is saying something. Your messages, how timely you are in sharing information, the tone of your communications, everything communicates, including silence. So even when you are quiet, you are saying something. So be intentional about your cues. Be very intentional about your cues. So if you've listened to that whole presentation and you are like, okay, I need help. I need something to do. I am here to help you. I have done this for 21 years. This, this is my experience. And I call myself the Robin Hood of communications. So I happen to have learned from a lot of big organizations. And my work is to help you to make sense of what is going on as far as communication is concerned. And so I'm here to help if you you want to contact me, my details are there. You can reach out to Rose um, and Rose and I are good friends. So she'll be, she'll be able to connect you to me. And that's the end of my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions and I hope you've all gotten something from there. What I'd like to tell you though, is that you were made for such a time as this. This is your moment. This is your time to shine. This is your time. And I don't mean shine in a selfish way, but this is your moment to truly impact your world your world within your organization, it, it, this is your time. You, you might do it afraid, but do it all the same. Your organization is counting on you. Your employees are counting on you. Your leadership are counting on you as HR people. And I can't think of a better team other than the public relations team uh, to speak to people and to really touch them where it matters, like the people in human resources. Because even by their own definition of your title, you are designed for humans. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Robin Hood. <laughs> Great presentation. Um, <laughs> a couple of questions coming in um, around communication. Mm -hmm. Is regular communication over communicating and where do you find the balance between that? In a time of crisis, you don't want to leave a gap. Remember what we've said, that nature abhors a vacuum. So you are better off over communicating than under communicating, okay? So you speak to your people regularly. Agree a cadence, okay? So we're not saying bombard them with messages every three seconds, but agree uh, a cadence. So if you're going to talk to them three times a day, please talk to them three times a day, okay? Let's be clear and communicate with them and say, you know, we're going to talk to you at 8 in the morning, at 12, and at 4. And if there's something that comes up in between, we will speak to you as, as well about it. But develop a cadence, all right, and a rhythm. So you are, you are better off over-communicating than under-communicating. Okay. Thank you, Stella. Mm -hmm. um, how regular should internal communications be within an organization? Well, we, you know, we are speaking to employees all the time. So I think internal communication is going on all the time. What you need to do is to structure it depending on which leader is engaging the organization. So let me give you an example. You as a team leader, you speak to your team on a daily basis, okay? When you're speaking organizationally, if it is the CEO, the CEO might be speaking to employees maybe on a quarterly basis, formally, within, let's say, a town hall structure. But also during market visits, he, he is communicating to people, okay? Uh, you might have communications for certain teams of people by diversity. So maybe how, speaking to women, do you hold regular meetings with your female talent or do you have regular engagements with your employees who have disabilities? I mean, an organization has to set a rhythm and a, and a pattern to their communication. What I would say is that you, you must follow an example that Coca-Cola uses, always in, always on. So everywhere you go, if you look at, at Coke, and I, I give Coke because they're the most ubiquitous, if you go around and look, you will find a Coke something somewhere. It is a sticker at the kiosk. It is the billboard on the road. It is that umbrella that hangs outside, you know, where you have your, your lunch. 
they are communicating with you at every touch point, but they are always in, they are always on. You, you know, you switch on the news at nine, they are the ad just before the news. So create a rhythm where you are always speaking to people at every time, okay? But of course, depending on the need, depending on the assignment and alignment of the teams. Okay, so it would vary from organization to organization, but just remember that there's a there should be a steady heartbeat. The same way your heart beats steadily, regularly, is the same thing you should aim for. Okay, yeah. I know you have another presentation at eleven, so we'll ask the last question before we can then invite the chair to give some remarks. Okay, how would you rate communication at the national level at the moment, and would you do anything differently? Hmm. This is a tricky question, but I shall answer it as a PR person. I will say this, that we have the right CS for health uh, at a health level. Okay, so as the national CS for health, I think he's doing a great job. Bearing in mind, number one, that he's not uh, a doctor. Okay, but he has come in very well and been able to fill the gap. So he's an excellent communicator and that I give him credit for. What he has also done as a leader, knowing very well that he's not a medical expert, is to surround himself with a very great team. So you know of Dr. Mwangangi, you know of Dr. Rashid, and we know of Dr. Patrick Amoff. Those three are the experts who are always around him, either presenting, co-presenting the briefing with him or leading the briefing and responding to the questions. So on that one, they've got it right. Uh, I think at a countrywide level, we recently experienced a gap, and I'm sure we all all, uh, you know, noticed the, the, the presidential briefing where we announced the partial lockdown of, you know, of uh, Nairobi Metropolitan, uh, Mombasa, Kilifi, and Kwale. The language in that uh, briefing, it sounded like a gazette notice that had been written by five different people and then pieced together. It flew over people's head, use of big words like cessation, movement within and out of. Uh, there were just things that weren't right. And of course, it caused a lot of uh, ripples. Uh, and I think we have seen that in the subsequent remarks that the head of state made, they have simplified the language. It's more friendly to the people. So with communication, you never hit 100%. There's always room to, you know, to improve. Uh, but I would say that with the CS of health there, he's doing a really great job. Uh, we don't see the president as often. He comes up when there are major things, but even he has improved. So I, I won't give them a rating just yet. It might be too early to give a rating, but I do think that we have the right man at the helm, you know, at the core steering the ship uh, in, in Mutahe Kagwe. Thank you, Stella. Yeah. Um, allow me to now invite uh, our chairman, uh, Mr. Sure. Joseph Bonyango, to give some remarks as well as thank our speaker before we can end the webinar. Okay, thank you very much, Rose. And uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Stella Kiguta. It's, um, I think, the first time you're talking to us on a webinar, and it has just come in at, a, at an excellent time. I can see the, the membership really thanking you for the clarity of thought and well-organized presentation that you've just given to us, and that applies to us. Um, uh, this is really perfect. And Rose, I think your um, organization and the timeliness in actually um, programming this and bringing in the relevant topics at the time when we really require them uh, as HR professionals. I want to thank you and I want to thank Irene and um, the Secretariat for bring, putting up this together. This, I can tell you, Stella, will go a long way in enhancing how we relate, in enhancing how we communicate to our fraternity and um, also improving the HR phase. You've really given quite important highlights and because of time, I may not go back to summarize, but I was taking note of um, every bit of it. Happily that um, as a good communicator as you are, you've even um, uh, you prepared the slides, which I think will remain with us so we can always um, make reference. Mm -hmm. And to all you um, members and participants, I also want to thank you very much for bringing in. And especially, I can see how uh, participative you are through the chats that um, are currently ongoing. It is indeed a, a powerful presentation. Um, some, a few things that uh, just uh, catches my eye and that I, I can tell you as a nature practitioner, as, as a nature practitioner, this really applies to me as an individual. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I take in, we are in a continuous um, learning mode. And I think as an individual, as an individual HR practitioner, you take in especially the key messages that uh, Stella has given us. Uh, just today, I was having also uh, as a communicator, I was also, remember HR, you are also the, the center of all this. So you are the, num the number one communicator on uh, what is happening both globally and the inside of the organization and outside. This morning, I was having conversation with my teams. And for, I play two roles, one as the CEO, of course, of the National Police Service, and another as a HR person. So uh, there are different teams designing I, I can tell you that one of the most challenging thing in a position like this is actually designing the content and the messaging that you want to give to the different facets of your um, uh, of uh, your audience uh, uh, during a crisis yeah, in, in crisis communication. You have to really target what is it that you as an HR want to tell the senior management team? What is it that you want to tell the general staff? What is the messaging that you want to give as a, to put as a communication so that it can help in, in managing the image of the organization. I think these are very key and important aspects that uh, we've all learned. And for me, my biggest take home is actually empathy, communicating, you must fail the people. Mm -hmm. What comes to my mind is what we had discussed in the earlier webinar on the virtues that we need to uphold during a crisis such as this. And it still remains, it goes back to the, kind of things that we talked about before. Kindness, patience, generosity, you know, orderliness and the fact that um, people will appreciate that they feel you fail them as much as they would want to empathize and feel um, uh, appreciate the position in which we are in. I have a few highlights, just three important things to tell you as HR fraternity. And since you are on this webinar, then you are the first to know. I'm um, just heeding what uh, Stella has just told us, uh, but these are issues relating to us as an institute of human resource management. One is that we had um, a very good council meeting last week, or was it this week? And um, of importance, I think um, it is important to give this information. We shall uh, give it, of course, in writing uh, and pass it through email communication. But good to you to know that um, uh, we had some uh, vacant positions um, uh, which had, has now been filled and we've uh, competitively filled the position of the CEO of uh, the HRM PEP. And um, I, that communication will be coming to you in a short while. And I think um, um, uh, doc, Dr. Douglas Ogola has accepted the offer and um, will be joining us soon. Um, uh, the council also has approved uh, critical positions, which we think are very important at this time to fill in the, in the IHRM secretariat, the head of operations, the head of HR and membership services. These are where serious places where we had gaps. Uh, audit um, positions and uh, we'll be seeing those uh, adverts coming up um, uh, very soon. We have critically looked at it and said it is very important that we have this so that we can continue giving you um, services that you require such as this one that is currently happening. Uh, we've already come together and um, put up together the, our response to the pandemic bill, what we call um, uh, Sakaja bill, and uh, we've uh, done the memorandum and uh, passed it over. So yeah, we managed to collate all your feedback and thank you very much those of you who contributed to this. Um, uh, next week we'll have a proper communication now that we've learned much more about this uh, on all that is happening despite um, the crisis that we are in. Remember, business um, uh, has to go on. So with those few remarks, I want to just thank you very much, Rose, and um, HRM, um, Irene, and your team. And a special thank you to uh, Stella. And uh, we hope that you can um, get back to her, either individually or through um, uh, Irene or through Rose, uh, through the Institute. And, um, do know, and I know probably will come back to you at one time, maybe later on, just to give us additional information on the areas of crisis communication. I think this was really, really important. And thumbs up to our child fraternity. Remember, keep safe. Asante Sana. Rose? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for your remarks. Thank you very much, Stella, as well. Always a pleasure to listen to you. And for the HR fraternity, let's not waste this crisis.
let's be strategic and intentional because everything communicates within the organization. So we look forward to seeing you in our next webinar next week. Look out for the flyer that will be coming through. And as Chair said, keep safe and God bless. We may now end the webinar. Thank Have a great you, day. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.